And thank you for joining us this evening. We are truly thankful for everyone tuning in tonight. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Alex Robinson. I'm the communications coordinator for Green Daughter. Um, again, as I always tend to start things off with, for those who don't know Green Goddard, we're a grassroots environmental group based in Huron County, and we're dedicated to reducing plastic usage and carbon emissions in our local areas, um, as well as protecting our natural ecosystems. So you can find us on Facebook by searching Green Goddard, or you can go to greengoddard.com. Um, so before we get going, we're just gonna let everyone know if you do have questions tonight, please post them in the chat um, and they'll be addressed as the webinar goes on. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to Dean Whalen for our introduction of the speakers and the topic for the evening. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, welcome everybody. I apologize. Uh, I was goofing around with my camera just before uh, <laughs> I joined this and somehow I managed to switch it off and can't get it back on. So uh, I can, you can hear me though, I, I expect everybody. Good. Okay, so um, I would like to start with an acknowledgement uh, uh, that the land on, on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Shinabeg, uh, uh, specifically the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, made up of the Saugeen First Nation and the Chippewas of Nawash, unceded First Nation. We thank the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation Environment Office for being here today to share some of their environmental stewardship practices with us. And it's my pleasure specifically to uh, welcome Alicia Jones. Uh, she's uh, the lead environmental technician and Alicia has a fish and wildlife technician diploma from Fleming College and has been working at the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation Environment Office for the past two years. Her primary responsibility is to help increase the collective knowledge and understanding of the health of the coastal waters through the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation territory. And joining her will be uh, Kathleen Ryan, and she's the full-time acting manager of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation Environment Office in Neashinamig, and perhaps she could, one of you can help me with how to pronounce that afterwards, Neashinamig, with a focus on energy and environment. Uh, Kathleen has been working with the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation on the Saugeen Peninsula lands and waters across Saugeen Ashinabikig in a variety of roles related to environment, fisheries, consultation and policy over the past 10 years. Uh, Kathleen has a Bachelor of Science in Indigenous uh, Environmental Science from Trent University and a uh, Master of Science in Aquatic Ecology from the University of Guelph. So uh, welcome uh, to you both and uh, uh, take it over from here. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that nice introduction. Um, like Dean said, I'm Kathleen Ryan. I'm the acting manager at the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation Environment Office and I have a background in aquatic ecology, and that is my area of most interest and passion, I would say. Um, so Alicia and I are gonna go through this presentation. I'm gonna start the beginning part of the presentation, and then Alicia and I will kind of go back and forth. And happy to answer um, any questions that come up in the chat as well, and, and we'll just kind of decide um, what questions we answer during and, and what questions we can answer um, <clears throat> maybe near the end. So I guess, Alicia, can you move it to the next slide? Thanks. So Dean did a pretty good job here of explaining a little bit about Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, but um, I'll give a little bit of an overview as well. Uh, so the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation is comprised of the Chippewas of Nawash and Seated First Nation, also known as the location of Nashinaming. So Dean, you are actually quite close on that name. And the Chippewas of Saugeen First Nation. So the two First Nations together and their territory uh, make up the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. So the governing body of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation is called the SAN or Saugeen Ojibwe Nation Joint Council. 
Um, this council is made up of the two councils, the two band councils from each First Nation. And the joint council deals with issues around territory, resources, consultation projects, and those types of things. Um, so they are really tasked with making decisions about projects and processes within the SON territory, as well as um, giving direction to develop our own pro uh, processes within the territory. So the SON Environment Office, where Alicia and I uh, work, is a technical body that was created by the Joint Council. And our mandate is really to support the Joint Council um, on key issues related to duty to consult and ongoing projects in the territory, and also kind of generally um, the environmental issues in the territory. Our lar larger goal in all of the work that we do, both at the Environment Office and at the Joint Council, is to protect the uh, Aboriginal and Treaty Rights of the SON membership, the people, and protecting the um, rights of the people is directly linked with protecting um, the lands, waters, and non-human beings of the territory. So it's all connected. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, so a little bit about the territory. When we say Saugeen Ojibwe Nation territory, what do we mean? And this other word, Saw King and Anishinaabe King. So Saw King is, um, the word in the language for Saugeen, so where that word come from. And Anishinaabe King just means um, the Anishinaabe land and the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation people are Anishinaabe people. Um, so Saugeen Ojibwe Nation territory um, covers a fairly large area. I don't know, Alicia, can you, are you able to zoom in on that at all? No. no. That's okay. Most of you will be familiar with the geographic area I'm talking about. Um, so the territory includes the entire Saugeen Peninsula and goes all the way south to the Maitland River, um, all the way east kind of through Arthur and comes up around the Nottawasaga River. And the territory includes all of the inland lakes and rivers. It also includes the lake beds and the waters of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. And you can kind of see if you can see in the diagram, but basically it kind of goes to the halfway point of Georgian Bay and to the US um, border uh, on the Lake Huron side. So very uh, large land and water territory. And there are many treaties within this territory, but the two main treaties, oh, there's the better map. Um, so there you can see that area a little bit more clearly. So you can see where the territory boundaries are. Um, just below Goderich uh, is the boundary over just past Collingwood. And then of course the whole territory there. Um, there's kind of two bigger treaty areas. One is Treaty 72, which basically starts um, from Highway 21 all the way up the peninsula. So Treaty 72 is the area that's currently in court uh, or is just finished in court for the land claim. So that's the area um, that the land claim is about. And then Treaty 45 and a half is basically um, most of the area below Highway 21 down into the more Southern parts of the territory, the Southern and Eastern parts of the territory. And um, you might say this in the next slide, but I might say it now. So, you know, originally the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation people were not two communities, Saugeen and Nawash. They were one collective community that lived in smaller settlements around the territory, um, traveling and, and moving around this area um, kind of as one community. And an elder explained it like this to me that, you know, we didn't have communities like this. Um, when we talked about the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, it really represented the land and the people, all of those things together. And next slide. So I touched on some of these things already, but um, just again, just for background information. So just a little bit about the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation culture. Like I said earlier, earlier uh, uh, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation people are Anishinaabe people uh, of the Three Fires Confed Confederacy. So the Potawatomi, the Potawatomi, Odawa, and the Ojibwe. So they're Ojibwe people of the Three Fires and often referred to also as Anishinaabe. Um, like I just said, the people of San have depended on the lands, waters, and wildlife in their territory for thousands of years. And we know this for certain um, from the archeological record that we have from this area, especially in areas like the Saugeen River. Also areas around 
<clears throat> excuse me, around um, the more northern parts of the of the peninsula around Tobamori. So the territory has been used by the San people for subsistence hunting, fishing, and enjoyment, spiritual practices, and ceremony. And really, the territory, the land, is at the core of San's history, tradition, and memory. Most of you know, all First Nations have you know some base shared culture but a lot of differences and specific things for different nations are really built around the land and around the connections with the land and teachings from the land. And San has this deep cultural relationship uh, with the land and with that relationship brings an inherent responsibility to protect the lands and the waters of the territory. And that's what we're trying to do with some of our work. Um, next slide. So really a lot of the focus of our presentation today is gonna to be around uh, water, fish and fisheries, uh, particularly because um, San people are fishing people and water and fish have always been sort of a central part of who the people are. Of course, they lived in an area surrounded by Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. Um, so of course, and the Saugeen River, these large rivers, of course, fish and the water have always been a central part of who San people are. Um, so we're going to kind of focus on this through the rest of the presentation. But I wanted to talk about um, some, this is kind of a history that brings some of this forward. So San commercial fisheries uh, across Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. So many of you will know that San members have a proven and asserted Aboriginal treaty rights, an active land, uh, land claim, lake bed claim, and a claim about treaty validity. We also have a court proven commercial fishing right to the waters of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. And this commercial fishing right uh, eventually turned into an agreement with the Ministry of Natural Resources, which led to uh, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation uh, commercial fishery occupying a large uh, part of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. And currently, um, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation manages that fishery uh, in cooperation with MNRF, but largely we have our own fisheries assessment program. And um, we also have the largest uh, indigenous commercial fishery in the Great Lakes. And we believe this is because the fishery and the fish have been such an integral part of uh, way of life for people. It's been economy for a long time, not just in modern day and not just you know in the commercial fishery, the way uh, the larger sort of commercial fishery. And again, that relationship with fish and water is really who Saugeen Ojibwe Nation people are. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, so like I said, we're gonna kind of focus again on water and um, fish. So I just wanted to talk, we're gonna focus actually on the coastal waters monitoring program that Alicia is the lead um, technician for. And that it was really like, um, uh, I don't know, a dream of mine for so many years for this monitoring program to happen. Um, but we have a lot of fisheries and water related uh, monitoring and research programs going on. Um, the NAWASH Fisheries Assessment Program, like I said, they do all um, commercial fishing assessment with all of the uh, commercial fishermen in the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. We're also currently doing a lot of projects about Cisco or Lake Herring, also known as Lake Herring, um, traditional ecological knowledge, ecology, and genetics around Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. We're involved in a genome project, which actually looks at um, being able to identify fish DNA in water. And so we can uh, learn more about what fish are using what habitats and it may be, you know, more um, effective sometimes than sampling, but I don't know what we do if we couldn't sample fish, that wouldn't be very much fun. But well, I maybe talk more about the um, genome project later. We're also doing uh, a project a big research program about lake whitefish lake trout interactions. So this is based on observations from uh, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation fish harvesters and also observations from others around the lake managing um, fish populations that um, whitefish have been on a decline for a number of years. Um, and now what we're seeing is that, you know, lake trout are eating large whitefish. There seems to be some overlaps in habitat use around the lake. And this project is really to understand more about 
what that interaction is, what's causing it, and what the impacts of that might be on um, the whitefish fishery. We've also been doing, again, whitefish is obviously a very important fish species to Saugan Ojibwe Nation. That's really at the core of the commercial fishery. So we do a lot of white, whitefish community engagement to understand more about people's knowledge and observations about uh, whitefish around the lake. Um, there's also a new project that the fisheries assessment is working on called Together with Gigoyuk, which means like together with the fishes. Um, and this is a big project that has a whole bunch of research tied into it that's very exciting um, and has to do with acoustic telemetry, which is basically you implant uh, transmitters into fish, you surgically implant them and you put receivers around the lake and you can look at the way that fish are moving uh, through the lake for pretty long time periods. It's a very, um, very interesting project. Um, you guys should actually have the Nawash Fisheries Assessment <laughs> Program come on because they have a lot of stuff that they're working on sort of in concurrence with the stuff we work on as well. Um, and then the Coastal Waters Monitoring Program. So we'll talk about this in the most detail today. Um, and this is something that um, without getting too long winded in about 2010, when I started doing fisheries research um, in the Saugan Ojibwe Nation territory, I remember going out in Stokes Bay and other bays and I was researching um, larval lake whitefish. And I remember asking someone like, who's monitoring this every year? And I remember researching at the time and seeing that there weren't very many even government organizations doing ongoing monitoring in some of these just amazing ecosystems and habitats. And so basically <laughs> since then, I've had this vision um, to start this monitoring program around the entire territory and for SON to sort of have ownership over that uh, in the way of building capacity, making that connection with the land and the water and doing that work and, and building that, um, that knowledge up. And, you know, part of, and we will mention that part of the Coastal Waters Monitoring Program and how it came to fruition was actually around some of Saugeen and Ojibwe Nation's concerns about the impacts and interactions between the Bruce Nuclear Generating Station. I'm sure you all know where that is. Um, so some of the monitoring program actually came out of our concerns around the interactions and impacts that uh, those operations were having on fish and fish habitat in sort of that area. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is how actually the program originally got funded. Bruce Power, after we'd expressed our concerns and, and proposed how we wanted to start addressing some of these concerns with our own independent uh, monitoring, um, they, they agreed and that's when we started the program. So we do have some sort of focus area around Bruce Nuclear, um, where we're trying to understand more about fish community, about habitat, about, or about habitat condition, about temperature conditions, um, and just more about sort of the unique micro ecosystem that exists around that power plant and if you know if people have any questions about um, what what those are like what those impacts are we can talk about that if people have questions otherwise i'll just um continue so i just wanted to take a really brief moment to talk a little bit about anishinaabe knowledge and this kind of what I'm describing goes by many names. You may hear it as traditional ecological knowledge, indigenous ecological knowledge, just traditional knowledge. Um, but it's really talking about the same thing. What it's talking about is um, a nation or a group's own ways of knowing and understanding um, their environment. And so when we talk about Anishinaabe knowledge from Saugan Ojibwe Nation's point of view, we're talking about um, San's unique ways of knowing and understanding the environment and the environmental science within our own um, knowledge system. And of course, our knowledge systems maybe aren't usually described this way, but they are based on ecological and cultural um, learning over long periods of time. And understanding this is a really important part of the Coastal Waters Monitoring Program and what we want to keep at the core of that. So this knowledge is both ecological and cultural. It's about connection and relationship. And it also is about science. Um, it, it shapes our understanding of the longer term cycles and dynamics of the environment of the territory, 
and those behaviors and ecologies of non-human beings. That's what I refer to sort of wildlife as just non-human beings, anything non-human is part of that environment. Um, <clears throat> so the reason I'm saying it shapes our understanding on longer term cycles is because um, this type of knowledge is passed on through generations and across families and occurs over a very long period of time. People have, um, have knowledge passed down to them from generations about even the long-term cycles of fish boom and bust, even without like a commercial fishery, talking about um, different 10-year cycles that we don't even understand in science because we haven't been trying to observe and document them for that long in that scientific way of thinking. And the way that this knowledge is transferred is not necessarily in the same way that Western science knowledge is transferred. So knowledge is transferred, I mean, in the past, largely through um, teachings, through uh, oral um, learning, but also through song and ceremony. The knowledge is also action-based. You learn and understand this knowledge through doing. So Anishinaabe knowledge is not a static thing, it's an action-based thing. And again, because of all these, it has a lot of depths and complexities that go beyond those of Western science or the way that we usually compartmentalize Western science. So the reason I'm mentioning this is this is kind of an important component of the work that we do, or not an important, a core component of the work that we do and the way that our office tries to um, kind of carry itself through sometimes that can be more sort of bureaucratic and technical work. And we're gonna use this and, and make sure we include community in how we understand some of the data that we collect and not just do sort of data analysis on it. We will do that, but we'll, we'll also do more. Next slide. Well, there's also a nice picture of a painted turtle and a golden shiner. Um, so I was just, just going to do sort of that introductory piece, I think. Um, and then I'm going to pass it back over to Alicia, uh, if you want. And um, Alicia will um, start talking on the Coastal Waters Monitoring Program. Did you want me to just show the video? Yeah, so we were gonna try to show a video and I don't know, I can't see on my screen. I don't know like where the hosts are, but we we're gonna try to show a video. So we'll attempt it and maybe somebody can write in the chat if it's not working, we just weren't sure. Um, this is a really nice video that um, another one of our environmental technicians, Emily Manser, she made this after the last field season. Um, if it doesn't work, we will send out the link for everyone. And I would encourage you to watch it um, when you have a chance. We as Saugeen Ojibwe Nation members have a deep connection to all of the lands, waters, and non-human beings within our territory. But there is a special connection to the water. We have relied on the water for sustenance and livelihood while caring for and celebrating it through ceremony and stewardship. This is a sacred relationship and it's crucial that we uphold our duty to care for and protect our water.
The Coastal Waters Monitoring Program launched with the goal of building a baseline inventory of the nearshore habitats and wildlife within our territory. This information will allow us to investigate differences in conditions between sites and potential causes for decreased health. of COVID-19, we were able to enhance our temperature and water quality assessment. In 2020, we set 55 nets deployed across 14 different regions within the territory. We caught over 40 different species and sampled more than 62,000 fish. In 2021, we plan to begin our field season in early April with sampling of larval fishes in Lake Huron. Temperature, water, and fish community assessments completed in 2019 and 2020 will be replicated across the territory. Several rivers and creeks will be monitored using electromagnetic backpacks and an additional region will be sampled. The Coastal Waters Monitoring Program is now one of the largest nearshore sampling programs in the Great Lakes. Many agencies and organizations will look to us for the information collected to enhance our overall understanding of the coastal regions of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. There, it seems like it worked. I'm glad we were worried about that. Um, I think some of you had trouble, but I hope most of you were able to see it. Um, we, I love that, <laughs> I love that video. Um, we got some pretty awesome imagery this year from um, a GoPro that, that we got. There was a question that came up in the chat um, and I just wanted to clarify the question from um, um, Rita, Rita? Um, so you asked, do you also test for isotopes in Lake Huron close to BP? If, if you do, which isotopes are you testing for and why? Um, I guess, I, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by isotopes. So there's, I'm just not sure if you mean like radionuclides or isotopes. So we have not in this program, we have done radioisotopes testing, but that's a little bit different. Um, we don't do any, um, we don't do any sampling for, for radionuclides ourselves. We just don't have the technologies to do that ourselves right now. We do though have a, an agreement with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Um, and we worked with them last year, uh, kind of the first the first time that um, that the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission has ever done this, but they extended and expanded their independent environmental monitoring program that they do. Um, and last year we participated in that. And what we asked them to do was extend the area that they were testing for radionuclides. So any, any types of radiation in the environment of any form. And also we asked that they work with our fishermen um, to collect fish from areas that um, the fishermen commonly collect fish to eat so that community members could understand if there was any risk in to their health from the from the fish that they're eating. So we worked with them on that program uh, last year and we also did some more stuff on on land in a larger um, area than they've ever done before and we didn't we didn't um, we didn't find anything um, we didn't find anything above um, background in any of those areas. So that was good. Um, and sorry, there was another, um, 
men there's another um comment i guess on the video that uh, asked about spotted gar so that was actually long nose gar um there's a lot of similarities between long nose and spotted gar um, but we've caught quite a few gar in the work alicia would know how many but definitely tons or not tons but lots of small juvenile gar um, and uh, some adult gar and they're very similar and long nose gar do have spots um, so you really have to get one and check out the ratio of its nose size the the spotted gar its nose is very short and condensed. So we did check into that because we thought that would be quite a find as well. Um, anyway, um, Alicia, maybe I'll let you uh, carry on. So I'll just go back to this slide. And so in 2019, uh, we launched the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation Coastal Water Monitoring Program with the goal to build a comprehensive monitoring program to gather baseline inventory and to continue annually to monitor the nearshore habitats of and wildlife of the territory. So the information will help us understand the current conditions and health of the coastal habitats and wildlife. Um, the, moder the monitoring program is an exercise of asserting SANS jurisdiction in the territory and by being on the lands and in the water. So we have community members that are employed with SAN and they're basically the eyes on the ground. So it also allows us to be able to see what's happening in the territory. And if there's any work being done that the environmental office is unaware of. And we're focusing on areas that matter to the community. So such as Bruce Power or Stokes Bay and the fishing islands and like around Naywash and Saugeen and any other like areas where community members have like an interest in. And we're, protecting and planning to, and adapting for the future. So here's just a couple photos of us during field season. Here's a spawning blunt nosed male. And then Emily was, who's in the middle there. She's the one that made the video, which was pretty awesome. And then the picture with us in the boat is just the three of us who are a part of the coastal waters crew. So the Coastal Waters Monitoring Program is um, a program and we monitor the nearshore communities. So we're basically um, just looking at the fish communities and like we come across all stages of life. So as Kat said, um, like you've seen in the video, there's that large um, long nose gar and then the one here is just like a juvenile uh, long nose gar. So we come across like all stages of life um, of fish and then we even have cotton turtles, snakes, and birds in our nets that by accident, all of them have been alive and survived. So we like just released them. And then we also monitor the temperature, the water quality. Um, we take an inventory of the wetland and aquatic plants throughout the territory while we're gathering our data. So 2019 was the first year that we and we're currently building our data every year and during as we gather our data we want to know what the current conditions are the differences in the conditions between each site um, to, uh, the differences in conditions how they connect with stressors in and around the aquatic environment and what changes do you see over time so with temperature habitat species abundance distribution and health and so just with like the past two years of doing this program like we have seen like slight changes but we can't really like go into detail about like what we've seen because it's just such a short period of time but even just comparing like the amount of fish that we have caught from this year and to last year has been a change and we have some data that we can share in the next couple slides so here's just a map the one on i the one that says 2019 is our 2019 um, map so we had 15 um, boundary locations. So just sample areas that we set. So we had our temperature loggers, we had um, set nets and we sained within each of those regions. And then in 2020, we had increased our boundaries. So we added two more sites and to include Meaford and Kincardine. So we now have 17 sites that we're monitoring throughout the summer. 
And here's just some of the data that we have um, collected over the years. So in 2019, we had 74 site locations. So that would be setting a net or seining um, and gathering our water quality data. And in 2020, we only had 53 and just due to COVID, like we weren't able to get out as much and just had like a later start. So it kind of put us back a little bit. And 2020, we had upped our temperature logger. So we now have 37 loggers that were out monitoring the water temperature throughout the territory over the summer. And we have, I believe, 19 that stayed out over winter just to monitor that temperature throughout the winter. And um, just some interesting things that um, in 2019, there was more species of fish caught in Lake Huron, or sorry, in 2019, there's more species caught in Georgian Bay than there was in Lake Huron. And then in 2020, it was reversed so that there was more species caught in, um, or abundance, I guess, in Lake Huron than there was in Georgian Bay. So here's just a couple pictures of um, like the fike net is what we use to sample all of our fish. So there's two wings that go out and then there's a wing that goes straight out the middle or the front of the net and the fish swim around the two wings and then get tr they get trapped and are forced to swim up the center uh, where the hoops are and then there's like a series of funnels so the fish aren't able to swim back out and then we'll monitor or we'll measure them um, the total length fork length and then ID them to the species um, and then they get released. Kat, did you want to go over the why coastal waters? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the first two years have been really interesting in the program, I'll just say, and Alicia has done an awesome job as sort of leading this program and doing all that work and looking at that map, I'm sure you can appreciate it, a crew of, well, I mean, it's amazing, it threw a crew of just three awesome women um, covered all of that area and did all of that in kind of five-ish short or maybe felt long, but five months. Um, and it is like so impressive. I'm just, every time I hear it, I'm amazed. Um, I guess there's a question of why focus on coastal waters and coastal waters are, have always been of, of particular interest um, to me because it's such a dynamic area uh, of the environment. So the near shore areas are just so important for sustaining life right? We get shallower water, means more productivity, plants, more um, planktons, more um, benthic invertebrates, so like more bugs, more, more tiny little beings, more fish, more diversity. Um, and these areas are not only important for sort of aquatic life themselves, but these are important areas for us human beings as well. If we think about uh, how much we benefit from from those coastal areas and, and how important they are. I mean, we think we know, I'm sure many of you know the importance of wetlands and wetland habitats, not only uh, as a part of the ecosystem, but the ecosystem or what's called an ecosystem service that they provide um, to all of us humans who, who like, you know, clean water and, and fresh water. Um, um, also in coastal waters, I think there's, there's such a diversity of fish and and we know that almost every single fish species in the lake, and there are a lot, uses near shore areas for at least one part of their life history. So their life history journey, basically from the time they're an egg to the time they're a spawning adult. Um, I always use whitefish as an example because they utilize a lot of these areas. The adults spawn kind of near shore, shallower water in the shoals um, that are in some places, they're in embayment, sometimes they're a little bit further offshore. They lay their eggs um, or they, they make their embryos. Then when those larval fish hatch in the spring, if they want to survive or if they're so lucky to survive, they get pushed into the shore into embayments. Um, and hopefully the water currents are moving 
in the right way to keep them there. And then larval fish get to feed and grow in these near shore areas. And not just whitefish, but a lot of larval fish depend on what we call larval nursery areas in these near shore habitats. And they depend on there being plants and productivity and very tiny little food sources for their tiny little mouths to fit around. You know, then again, if I'm talking about whitefish, they kind of stay in these areas till they're juveniles and start moving back out to the lake. But then as adults, they cycle through this near shore offshore cycle every year. Like I already said, near shore wetlands are super important for water quality, for human health, and they're essential habitat, not only for fish, but for turtles, snakes. Um, every time I say snakes, I'm just waiting for Alicia to like, she doesn't like snakes, but, um, and then also really important for secretive migratory and wetland birds, um, which we don't think about a lot because we don't see a lot of wetland birds a lot because like I said, they're, a lot of them are secretive. Um, wetlands in these coastal areas just provide the right um, structures, water temperatures, food and areas that are protective and let them hide from predators and uh, basically grow. So next, please. So I always say we sometimes forget about the huge diversity of small fish that live in the lake and we focus on those large fish that we can see or the fish that we eat. So we focus a lot of, of thinking, or not we, but in general, we think a lot about whitefish, trout, salmonids, bass, these types of fish. And we often don't think about all of the different species of minnows and shiners and darters and gar and all these fish that we don't eat. So we generally don't interact with them. Um, but each of these small fish have a purpose and a place in creation and in the ecosystem. And all of these things are vital to the health of the lake and the health of those large fish that though most of us like to eat. It's important to remember them, to learn their names and to understand their roles in the ecosystem. I just put this big list of thing here, just listing all of the different types of, of, of not only fishes, but other aquatic um, life that lives in these areas. And um, we often just don't think about them. A lot of people I feel like think there's, there's minnows and there's shiners and then there's bass and that's the perch and kind of bigger fish. And there's just so many small fish and they're just so cool and interesting. And they mainly reside in these near shore areas. Next. There's a picture of a long nose gar and I don't know what those, are in the tub, but <laughs> I think they're probably mostly the mimic shiners or sand shiners that we caught, but they vary in size too. So we catch minnows that are like less than a 10 centimeter or 10 in or millimeters. And then we catch them up to like, I don't know, we had the long nose gar, I think was almost 93 centimeters long. So almost a meter. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, Alicia goes from identifying fish from, from a couple millimeters size up to a meter size. Next. So I'm just noticing the time and this is something we wanted to talk about, but maybe, I don't know, Alicia, you can, do you wanna to try to talk about this in like a high level or do you want me to try and you can? Yeah, you can go. Okay, so we just wanted to bring this up because this is an issue that we've been seeing increasing uh, over the last couple of years. And Alicia has been spending a lot of time working on this. And we've been talking this whole time about how important the coastal areas and the shorelines are. Um, so we've, we've gone through that. Um, we, we know that over time, there's a lot more development pressures around the territory, tons of development pressure. Um, in some parts of, of, you know, Bruce County, Huron County, and especially as you move up on the peninsula, development is really increasing on the shorelines with cottages and docks and all sorts of things. Um, we also have a really changing environment and we all know that the water levels um, are currently very high. Um, and this is bringing up a lot of issues um, both at the municipal level and for homeowners. Homeowners, cottage owners, um, municipalities are seeing massive damage to their property or imminent damage to their properties. Um, and most people don't know this, but as part of 
our sort of jurisdiction and our decision making in the territory, Alicia, um, we see um, we review all uh, permits that go to MNR for um, any in water work, any work that's going to happen in the water. We review that and we talk with MNR and sometimes with the um, the homeowners about that work. And we've been really concerned over the last couple of years about. Um, the amount of applications we've seen for um, hardening the shoreline uh, to protect properties. And this is to protect properties from a high, wa high water levels. Can you go to the next slide, Alicia? Okay, maybe I'll just, so why don't you talk about the bioengineering really quickly, but we've basically been getting a lot of applications just for basically large, um, uh, what's the word, Alicia? I'm, it's escaping my mind. Like the in-water work permits? Yeah, like, but for basically walls, right? Yeah, armor stone, there you go. Stone. For armor stone walls, yeah. for building of groins, for building of all sorts of things to protect properties from damage. And well, we appreciate and we know how important it is and, and um, you know, people's homes are important to them and they don't want them to be destroyed. If we think about the cumulative impact of 200 people building groins or armor stone walls in the shoreline to protect their properties, that's going to have um, a big cum cumulative effect on the ecosystem level. Um, those things really impact the way that water currents move. And earlier when I talked about the larval fishes, they need those water currents and embayments um, to work a certain way. And water currents can really change a lot of things. It can change the way energy moves through the environment. It can change the way fishes move through the environment. Um, and it also kind of changes the habitats in those areas just in general. So we're really trying to promote as much as we can bioengineering um, for shoreline areas. So I know we're running low on time, but I'd, I'd like Alicia to just go through um, bioengineering. And if anyone has a, a shoreline property and you're interested in looking into this, I really encourage you to look at the bioengineering options that are out there for you. Um, go ahead, Alicia. So just to quickly go over what bioengineering is, it's the use of, it's the combina combination of um, engineering techniques and natural materials and structures to stabilize the soil. So basically you want to be able to plant native species of plants, uh, trees and shrubs um, and any biodegradable material. So you could use like, say you're trying to build up a bank that's eroding, you could use logs and have them as like a living bank so that it eventually will protect the shoreline or the bank with the roots that are growing into the bank. And it's basically a self-repairing shoreline to prevent uh, erosion. So it has benefits for in the long run as, and it's more so like you have to do it as a preventative measure instead of like a reactive measure. So it improves the wildlife habitat, it's uh, erosion protection, it improves the water quality, it minimizes uh, runoff from pollution. So like if you use any like pesticides or like fertilizers on your lawn, you don't want that stuff running into the lake because you can cause algae blooms in your lake or just cause a mess in the ecosystem. So you wanna have like a buffer um, as like your, um, along your shoreline. And it's relatively less maintenance than having like an armor stone or any other kind of um, hardened shoreline. Uh, this, and yeah, so again, like there's less nuisance of algae when you have um, your natural shoreline. And then again, it's just to like using native species, grasses and trees and shrubs to have that deeper root structure to protect your, um, protect the erosion of the soils that are along your uh, shoreline. So the problems with hardening the shoreline, it's only a temporary fix. So you're constantly gonna be adding armor stone to your shoreline and you're gonna constantly be having to repair all of the work that you've have put in just because the it's not stable and it's, it doesn't have roots to hold it in place so like for example these 
um, the stones there, the armor stones, they are possibly all gone by this, um, by the spring with just ice movement and having it um, pulled out. And it just doesn't create a very good habitat for the fish and wildlife. So it's basically a barrier between the land and the water. So if we can answer questions now or Kat, you had anything else to add? No, I think that's it. I know there's some questions in the chat about where to find information about bioengineering. Um, we probably have some links we can send. Maybe Alicia could yeah. send those. Um, like there's some, there's some work that uh, other areas have done, especially Lake Simcoe. Um, Lake Simcoe, they're in a bit of a different environment, of course. So a lot of these things, or some of these things I should say would not be exactly applicable just because of the different system. Um, but they did a lot of work there because of the amount of erosion happening. And there's also other initiatives that have happened in other areas uh, of Canada and more specifically Ontario where erosion is a serious problem and threatening people's sort of homes and or livelihood. So maybe Alicia can get together some of those resources and um, send them along to, to the hosts and they could share them with others. And I know Alicia, I think, uh, I think we will be working actually to kind of do our own bioengineering sort of promotion or whatever you wanna call that. Um, looking at some potential pilot projects to promote bioengineering. And we're right now looking in areas like the fishing islands um, um, where we think that we could demonstrate what a good bioengineering project would look like. And we know that area is definitely affected by uh, high water levels right now. Um, Yes, I also agree the uh, Phragmites may be too effective at bioengineering. <laughs> that, is, that is correct. Um, you know, it's actually very interesting. I don't want to go on a Phragmites rant, but it's very interesting because, you know, I used to work in Lake Erie and where Phragmites are a very, very serious problem and have basically killed entire ecosystems. Um, they're so dense, the areas I worked in in Lake Erie and the Long Point Bay ecosystem that literally turtles, um, different things die because they can't get through them. Here actually, the density of Phragmites here, we don't want Phragmites here, we want to remove them. But we've done some research into this and right now, they're providing fish habitat. They're providing some of the things you're talking about here about the effectiveness at bioengineering. They are creating this really strong buffer against some of the energy and the water levels in some of these shoreline areas. So it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite interesting. And the question, are you recording invasive species? We're absolutely recording invasive species. Um, Alicia can say like we got tons, I'm sure tons of round gobies. Um, I don't know what other invasives, like that's the main invasive we would deal with, but. There's like the common carp and other stuff that are more almost naturalized now, but any like common carp and other species of fish and then even plants, whatever plants are invasive will make note and then we'll try and remove whatever we see while we're at the site. Yeah. Um, I know we have four minutes. Um, there was a question about the TC Energy Project. Uh, I'll just say about that, I was gonna, I was writing the, the response to Linda. Um, and I just wanna say that, you know, we too have a lot of concerns about the potential for the TC Energy Pump Storage Project. Uh, to have impacts on the aquatic environment, especially in that region. It's an extremely important fishing area for SON, both historically and, and currently. Um, but we are, we don't, we don't understand what the impacts could be yet. We're, we're gathering the information about the project. We have a lot of our own information and data for that area. Coastal Waters will be doing a lot of work in that area over the next couple of years. Our bigger fisheries assessment program will also be doing uh, work there. But so you know, Saguenay Ojibwe Nation does have consent on this project. So if Saguenay Ojibwe Nation does not ultimately support the project, it will not go ahead. 
So we do have that commitment from TC Energy on this project and, and we are watching it very closely and trying to make sure we have all the information we need um, to make, um, to you know, have an influence on that project. Okay, uh, this is Dean here. Sorry, I can't get my camera to work. Um, we're approaching eight o'clock and I'm, man, uh, this is just fascinating. Um, your work is awesome. Uh, and there's, there's just so much there. It really is incredible. Um, so uh, we'll communicate directly with uh, uh, Kathleen and Alicia after the uh, webinar. And please, if you have questions, put them into the chat and we can forward them to them. Uh, make any comments. Uh, this is being recorded. And so uh, if you wish to watch it again or, or uh, send a link to your friends, we'll be sending that to everybody who has been uh, registered here. Um, again, so much thanks to you, Kathleen, and to you, Alicia. Uh, anything you have, wish to say to kind of wrap it up and uh yeah i'll just say chima Gwetch, thank you very much for uh inviting um for the opportunity um i think i was just about to type in the chat i guess we need to have another session just on bioengineering but mm. uh very interesting and thank you very much yes we'll, we'll certainly talk to you about <laughs> about future sessions i'm sure Okay, um, I guess that's about it. We're pretty much uh, right on eight o'clock. And uh, again, uh, thank you so much. This was, this was a, just a great experience. Thanks for having us. Oh, welcome. Thank you so much for preparing this. All right, Alex.